Hello everyone, welcome to our third lecture on Mechanics and Materials 1. In this lecture we would like to talk about equilibrium of rigid bodies and essentially we are covering the chapter 4 of the Pierre Johnson book. This is also our third lecture on the lecture series on introduction to statics. We have six of such lectures. So by now we have learned how to deal with the equilibrium of particles and points. And that's what we did in chapter two. In that case, essentially we have equilibrium of forces and equilibrium of moments. And if you remember, we said for a point, for a particle, because it has no dimension, the second equation usually does not matter for us. After that, we learned how to deal with equivalent system of forces in rigid bodies. So here we are not talking about points with zero dimension, we talk about rigid bodies. And then basically for those bodies, we try to transform them to a point. Okay, so in the first lecture, we learned how to handle equilibrium of a point. In the second lecture, we learned how to transform a body to the point. So what we want to do now is to combine these and we want to write the equilibrium of rigid bodies. And essentially this is the chapter four of the Beer Johnson book. Now equilibrium of rigid bodies is in principle very similar to the equilibrium of points. The only thing is that you would have this intermedi intermediate step to draw an equivalent system of forces. And as we will see later, this intermediate step is only a step for you to better understand the problem. This is not necessary to solve this problem. So again, this is maybe if you want to just look at it, it's again a two-step process. Step one, draw free body diagram. Step two, impose equilibrium. So it's exactly what you did for a point. Now, the only difference is that when you want to draw free body diagram and you want to draw the external forces, you may have additional forces that they appear in a body and they have different values in different parts of the body because the body has a dimension. It's not a point, something like weight, for instance. So you, you would include also the weight usually. But also, and more importantly, you would have reactions. So if you have a body and it is in equilibrium, it means that you are supporting the body with some supports. And those supports, they are applying reactions, they are applying forces to keep the body in equilibrium. And then again, if you want to better understand it, or if you want to do what we learned in the previous lecture, you always have a chance to draw an equivalent system of forces and this intermediate step, maybe it helps you to better understand the equilibrium, but then again, it's not uh, necessary. So once you have the free body diagram, you can come down and write equilibrium. And then equilibrium is again, exactly what we did. That means the sum of forces is zero, the sum of moments with respect to a point is zero. Before I go further, I just mentioned one very short remark that we may also see supports such as bearings in the following example. Usually we assume that bearings do not support moments. Okay, so this is a property of bearing. Obviously, in one, let's say, in, in one direction, you you are certain that the bearing does not support any moment, but also in the other two directions, we usually assume there is no support for moments from bearings. There are two tables showing the supports in the book. The left table is in 2D, the right table is in 3D, and these are the well, well known supports and you will, you will basically see them quite frequently throughout the course. Some of them are more familiar to you, some of them less familiar, but I would just like to go through them fairly quickly. 
So if you think about supporting 2D, usually they can apply either forces or moments. So you have two forces in the y and x direction and you have also a moment. So a support in 2D can at most apply three components, two forces, one moment. But also different supports, maybe they apply individual forces or just moment. And we want to just learn that. So if you have a support like this, and we call this rollers, usually we show them like this, but also in the example, maybe you will see them like that. So this is another way of showing a roller. So if you have something like a beam and then there is, there is just a little ball underneath, it means it's a roller. If you put this little vertical space, let's say it's like in, it's in the air and there is, an, there is a gap between the ground and, and the support that also usually means a roller. So in different books, you may see different notations or different drawings for rollers. But the important thing is that if you have a roller, you only get a force in the vertical direction. So you only get your reaction force in the vertical direction and rollers cannot fix the body in the horizontal direction. Okay, So the body can slide basically or can, can move in the horizontal direction. Then you get also other supports such as cables and links. So cables and links, they have this property that they prescribe or they apply a force only along the member itself. So if you have a cable, it can only apply a force in the same line as the cable. If it is a cable, it's always tension. And if it is a link, it could be tension and compression. So a link, it's a thin link. It's similar to a cable in the sense that it applies a force that is aligning the member, but it can be compression or tension. In the case of cables or ropes, it's always tension. Okay, so you have uh, colors and these colors essentially are moving members on a on a rod or on a lever or something and then uh, they usually are also frictionless that means they only apply a force that is normal to that member and then their direction along the rod itself is zero also you may think of just what we usually call just a pin or a hinge and pin or a hinge is like a roller, but is now also fixed in the horizontal direction. So it applies forces in both vertical and horizontal direction, but it fixes the coordinates. So there is no, you, you don't get translation. So then again, if you just look at these numbers, these numbers show you how many constraints do you get. So from the previous, supports we always had one component applied so one force basically now you get two forces the last support in 2d is just what we usually call fixed support and if you think of a beam for instance that is clamped to a wall this is usually a, an example like that okay so if you think of a beam like that you are also talking about a fixed support. Now, a fixed support applies two forces, but also it applies a moment. So it doesn't allow the member to rotate, but also it doesn't allow the member to move. That's important. If you compare that with a hinge, a hinge would prevent motion, but it does not show any resistance with respect to, let's say, rotation with respect to that pin position itself. Okay, so that was supports in 2D. Now you can also have them in 3D. It's essentially the same, the same thing, the same game. If, if you think of a roller in 3D, 
you you can show them like this so this would be your usual roller support you can also have cables again you can have wheels on rails that they essentially move in a certain direction so then you get two forces two force components resisting in this case for instance you can imagine it it resists the motion in this direction and also it resists the motion in this direction but in this direction it does not apply any reaction force or you can think of something like a, a ball and socket or this is more like a hinge in 3d they just apply forces but they don't apply moments you can also think of bearing so again bearing usually they in this direction they are not supposed to apply any moments so they they let the bar to rotate freely inside the bearing but also again we assume usually we assume also in the other direction they don't apply a support so they are they are drawn here so you see these two supports but usually we assume they don't exist here okay you find these tables in the book and you can study them in detail we will better understand them throughout the examples and throughout the semester but for you important thing is that they they appear all the time all right so the next topic we would like to talk about are just three remarks on equilibrium and equilibrium of rigid bodies for that matter the first remark deals with two-dimensional problems and basically we want to talk about the conditions that we have on equilibrium equations for two-dimensional problems such that they work for us okay so in a two-dimensional problems you have two translational coordinates so basically that would be x and y and then you have a rotation that's the third direction so usually you are talking about three equations, three unknowns. However, not every set of three equations would, would work for you. So mathematically speaking, that means the three equations that you are, you are dealing with, they should be linearly independent. Otherwise, it's not going to work for you. We, we want to better understand what that means from a mechanical perspective. So for your three equations, if you... If you use equilibrium of forces in the x direction, equilibrium of forces in the y direction, and the sum of moments with respect to a point, these three equations, usually they give you three independent equations and, and they work well. So as, as far as you can, you should use this combination. But sometimes in some problems, it turns out that other combinations are more helpful. And then the trick is to use those combinations, but also to use those combinations properly such that you can solve your three unknown equations. This is an example of that. For instance, instead of having the equilibrium in the y direction and the moments with respect to a point A, maybe you want to replace that by another equilibrium with respect to a point B. So again, if you think of this set, this is also this is also three equations, and it should help you to get your three unknowns. However, if you are not careful in choosing points A and B, then this doesn't work for you. And in this case, if, for instance, if you think that you are talking about the sum of forces in x direction, that means that the line AB cannot be parallel to y axis. So it should be, if you want it to work, the line AB cannot be parallel to y axis. I'm trying to explain that in this figure. For instance, you can think of this scenario. You have a little circle or a wheel or something like that now think that you have a force f in the x direction and then on two points a and b maybe you have two forces like that and then these are the components of the forces 
Now, if you use the first set, it just works. You can you can say, well, the sum of the forces in x direction is zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero, and then if you write the balance with respect to A, you can calculate the unknowns. However, you can see if if you write the sum of if the sum of moments with respect to B in the horizontal direction, you essentially get an equation which has only F1. So the, the P does not apply any moment with respect to A. Okay? So if you write this equation, you don't see anything or any information about P. Now if you write this equation also, you don't see any information about P or Q. So basically, again, remember, the sum of for forces in the y direction would mean P plus Q is zero, for instance, in this example. Or, uh, sorry, this would be P minus Q zero, if, if you want. Okay? They, because they have an opposite direction. Well, it depends if you are talking about the vector P or vector Q. So if you, if you are writing them as vectors, maybe we just write them the, with bold letters. So if it's a bold letter, it's just P plus Q is zero. But eventually, it means that if you think about the numbers, they should be the same number. So maybe if P is 100, Q must be also downwards and 100. Okay, so we know that. But if you write the balance, in the x direction, you just get f1 plus f2 equals f. So that doesn't give you any information about p and q. If you write the balance with respect to a, it doesn't give you any information about p or q. If you do that, it doesn't give you any information about p and q. So basically, it tells you that these three equations, they are effectively only two linearly independent equation so it doesn't work for you this is not a good set of equation for this example obviously if you chose point b or let's say a point c here and and you wrote the balance of moment with respect to that that could have worked okay so that's important that if if you have a problem like this you should make sure that line a b is not parallel to the y-axis. This is just an example, but it's it's only to, to show you why and how these things don't work. So you don't have to memorize the cases that they work and they don't work, but it's only to show you that if you write them and they don't work, so you get some equation which looks like 0 equals 0, you, you should know that you have not chosen your equations properly. Another example, and this is kind of the counter example of this one, is that if you use the balance of forces in the y direction, but then you chose AB in the x direction along the x axis, that doesn't work either. So if you have this combination, so if you are using balance of forces in the y direction, the two points AB for which you write the balance of moments, they cannot be parallel to the x axis if you want it to work. Another one is that if you think of just three moment equations, so you can also do that, it's also three equations, but then these three equations, only work if ABC forms a triangle. Okay, so the three points ABC with with respect to which you write the balance of moment equations, they should form a triangle. So again, if this is your circle, if this is your point A and this is your point B, your point C should be somewhere here. Okay? You cannot choose a point C, for instance, here. This doesn't work. Okay, this is not useful. If the point C is along the line AB, it's not useful. And then Basically, it means it doesn't form a triangle. So in other words, you can say ABC cannot be collinear for this thing to work.
Okay, so we said we have three remarks. This was the first remark. So be careful with your balance equations. The next remark that we have is that the system must be properly constrained. So what does that mean? Again, remember constraint essentially means the, the unknowns that you have on the, on the problem. So the support reactions are the constraints and the equilibrium equations are the conditions, okay? So you have conditions, you have constraints and the cons so you have constraints and then conditions. And conditions, essentially, it means it's equilibrium conditions. Now, these equilibrium conditions are your equations. The constraints are the unknowns. The idea of this remark is to tell you that there must be a balance between the number of constraints or unknowns and the number of conditions or equations. This is what we want to talk about. Otherwise, if the balance is not there, if they are not proper, then we would say the system is not properly constrained. So again, if you want to think about it more mathematically, you can think of the number of unknowns. So this hashtag means the number of so the number of unknowns could be more than the number of equations. The number of unknowns could be less than the number of equations. And the number of unknowns could be equal to the number of equations. So we get three different cases or three different types of problems. And we want to know which one is good, which one is not, and how we, we should handle them. So the first case, if the number of unknowns is more than the number of equilibrium equations, that means your system is over-constrained or is overly constrained. Such systems are in equilibrium, but we cannot solve them. An example of that is shown here. So if you think you have just a member or a bar in the horizontal direction and you apply a force P on it, then you can see at each hinge, so again, if you support it using hinge, Then at each hinge, you, you get two reactions, Bx, By here, and then Ax, Ay here. So you don't know them. This is unknown, this is unknown, unknown, unknown. So that means you have four unknowns. And you have only three equations. So you are dealing with the classical case of number of unknowns more than the number of equations. That means you have overly constrained the system. Again. The system is in equilibrium. The beam stays statically and constrained, basically, but it is indeterminate because it's over constrained. You cannot solve this using a static knowledge. Okay, what you should do, or what you could do, or the type of examples that you can solve are the examples that they are on one hinge. So if it is hinged, then you get two unknowns but on the other side you should use a roller if you use a roller then you don't get a force in the horizontal direction you only get one unknown let's say at point b and then in this case you can see that you have now three unknowns and it, it satisfies your three equations so you can basically solve this type of system. Okay, so the first type of system that you may encounter with are the statically indeterminate system. And then again, statically indeterminate means that using the equilibrium equations of statics, you cannot solve this. So these are equilibrium equations of static. If you use these, you cannot solve this type of equations for this type of problems. We need something more than that, and we will learn that later. 
but you should know that it's statically indeterminate. That's the first one. So over construct. The second one, well, if the number of unknowns is now less than equilibrium equations, and if we call the previous one over constraint, obviously this one is now under constraint. You may also refer to it as partially constrained. An example of that would be that member that we just showed, but now this time it is on roller on both sides. So if it's on roller on both sides, that means it gets no resistance against x direction. So we don't have a force in the x direction from either of the supports. And that means this thing can just move in the horizontal direction. Okay, so this is this is more like a mechanism. It just moves. It's not statics anymore. It's under constraint. It's not in equilibrium, if you want. Now that we have these two, the third case is that the number of unknowns are equal to the number of equilibrium equations. However, even in this case, if you are not careful because of what we just discussed in the previous remark, in remark one, you may also end up with a system which is improperly constrained. Okay, so over constraint, under constraint. But now if the number of unknowns and equations are the same, it may still be improperly constrained. And that's not good either. And this is an example of an improperly constrained system so you could have three rollers and each of them would apply one force in the vertical direction but you can imagine that now you have three unknowns but you cannot solve this equation or you cannot solve this system it, it can still move in the horizontal direction it's still not properly constrained so it's not still properly constrained in the, same, in the sense of aesthetics. Okay, so the only thing that we are interested in are the systems that are properly constrained, at least for the first part of the lecture that's about statics, because then you can solve them using statics equation. Later, we also learn how to handle statically indeterminate systems. All right, so we wanted to have three remarks. We had remark one, this is remark two. Now, remark three is fairly simple and it's about equilibrium of multi-force bodies. So basically, this is the, the story. If you, if you have a body on which you apply no moment, so it's only force, okay? If it is only force, then, if you do not have a lot of forces, you can simplify or you can think of two types of problems. One is two force body. So let's say you are talking about something that is force only, so there is no moment, and there are only two forces. That's something interesting to talk about. The other thing is just three force body. Okay, so also that's an interesting thing to talk about and we want to talk about it now. So a two-force body is something like this, as shown in the picture. And essentially this is what it is. If only two forces applied on a rigid body, they must be equal of magnitude, or they must be of equal magnitude and opposite direction on the same line of action to satisfy equilibrium. Fulfill equilibrium. So if you have a body and there are only two forces acting on the body, these two forces must be equal in magnitude, must be in opposite direction, and must be aligned the same line of action. And you can easily imagine if this is not true, for instance, if, if the force F here, it was applied a little bit down on the line of that line of action, then these two forces, they create a couple and it's going to turn the member. If they are not equal in magnitude, then this member would also move in the 
line or in the direction of the line of action. Okay, so it's fairly simple. It's a simple concept. If there are two forces acting on a body, we call this two force body or two force body problems. And then equilibrium of these are fairly simple to satisfy only if these con con conditions are met. Members that they do like or they behavior like this are uh, trust members or links. So if you have something like a link, it does that. If you have something like a cable, it does that. But also if you have a body, a three-dimensional body on which there are only two forces applied for whatever reason, then they also fall into this category. You will see how this will help you to solve problems through examples later. The second example, or the second case, is three-force body. And then again, it's, it's just a concept. It's a, it's a very simple thing to think about, but they are powerful remarks to help you solve examples. So if you have a three-force body, if only three forces are applied on a rigid body, they must be concurrent or parallel to fulfill equilibrium. So concurrent, by concurrent I mean this. So if there are three forces acting on a body, they should all meet at the same point. Otherwise they cannot satisfy equilibrium. And then again, you can, you can imagine that because if, you, let's say if this is point A and you want to say, write the moment with respect to A, now this would be zero because none of these would apply a moment with respect to A. If any of them is not along that line, so if, if this force, for instance, was a bit off, so it was like this, then the balance of moment with respect to that point would not be satisfied. Now, if, if this is not the case, then they must be parallel. So they cannot be something in between. They should be exactly parallel, or if they are not parallel, they should meet at the same point point to fulfill equilibrium. So that's three body, three force body. Again, we wanted to have three remarks. We learned about remark one, two, and three. The third is equilibrium of multi-body forces, and that's two, two force body and sorry, equilibrium of multi-force bodies, and that is two force body and three force body. And then again, these are fairly simple concepts. What we want to do next is to learn this or to use this through a few examples together. So we will have three exercises to come now. All right, so exercise one of this lecture is similar to problem 4.2 of Beer Johnson book on page 167. Consider the beam given in the picture. You can, you can neglect the weight of the beam for now and assume that the only forces applied on the beam are the ones shown here. So you have a force P of 70 kN and then two forces of 27 kN each applied. And then the distances are shown also on the picture. Determine the reactions that supports A and B. Okay, so we have two supports. This support at A is a roller. And then you can look into the support table. And this is also a hinge. So that means at point B, we get two reactions. And at point A, we get one reaction. So we have three unknowns. And it's a two-dimensional problem, so three equations we will have. So it should work properly. If we draw the free body diagram, we see this. So this is the free body diagram of the figure. And what we want to do next is to just write the balance equations. So we write the balance of forces in the x direction. 
balance of forces in the y direction and balance of moments with respect to a point in this case we, we choose point b so you can write the balance of moments with respect to b or a or any other point but we just choose b also we always should show what we assume as the positive direction for the forces so for instance when i apply equilibrium equations in the x direction i i would get bx so i i want to know if i should write this as minus bx or as plus bx or minus bx in this case because we assume the direction towards right is plus it appears with a plus sign for the y direction for instance you can see that a y is upwards but 70 kilonewton is downward so that means later when we write the equations we would write a y with a plus sign and then 70 with a minus sign of course the a y value itself if, if it ends up being negative that means the direction that we have chosen was wrong and then we can modify that direction the same thing for the moment so we assume that the counterclockwise direction here is positive so a rotation like that is is positive and any force that produces a moment that wants to turn the body in the counterclockwise direction that would be a positive moment okay so balance of forces in the x direction in the x direction we have only one force bx so bx plus bx in this case is zero in the y direction we have plus a y again upward b y is upward so again upward directions are plus so plus a y plus b y downward directions are minus so minus 70 minus 27 minus 27 this is the balance of forces in the y direction now you want to write the balance of moments with respect to b with respect to b if you think of the two forces here you have this force 27 that it wants to turn the body in a clockwise direction and then you have also this one that wants to turn the body in the clockwise direction so these would be both clockwise and they both eventually appear with a minus if you think of 70 70 wants to turn this in the counterclockwise direction so it would appear with a plus but also if you think of a itself with respect to b also it wants to turn the member in the clockwise direction so it would also appear with a minus if you write it in vectors it would be easy if this happens automatically but because here we assume them just to be a scholar we should we should be careful about that so this one the minus 27 times 0.6 is the moment of this because the distance is 0.6 and then exactly we said why the direction requires a minus the the next one the distance is 1.2 and then again it wants to turn clockwise so you get minus 27 times 1.2 a y the same thing the distance is 2.7 and it wants to turn in the clockwise direction so you get minus a y times 2.7 and then the 70 is just a counterclockwise direction so you get plus 70 times 1.8 so these are the three equations that we have and well you have three equations three unknowns but the first equation is is kind of trivial so basically here you have two equations, two unknowns, and you can calculate a y and b y. So that's that. Essentially, you, you were asked to calculate the support reactions, and these are the support reactions. You are done. But also, considering what we have talked about previously, and sometimes, again, this is useful for you, you could alternatively use a different set of three equations and solve exactly this problem. So if you wrote the balance with respect to x direction, you get the bx. Now, if you look at this equation, writing balance with respect to b, it gives you only one unknown, and that is a y. So that's easy to calculate a y. 
If instead of the second equation, you wrote the balance equation with respect to A, then you get an equation which has only BY. Okay, so you don't get this system. Here you have kind of two equations, two unknowns, but here you would have one equation per unknown. So you would get individual equations per unknown, and then you can compute them individually. Sometimes in terms of calculation time, this may be faster for you because you don't have to look into combination of equations and put the result of one equation to the other. But then again, that also means that you should be careful about choosing the equations properly. If you are experienced with this, if you have a lot of exercise, this should work well for you. But the safe choice is always the sum of forces and then sum of moments with respect to just one point. Exercise 2 is similar to problem 4.5 on page 169 of the Beer Johnson book. The system is given in the picture. You have essentially a wheel here with a spring attached on top and the spring is attached to a wall. And then on, on that wheel itself, a lever is attached along the radial direction. And then you have a weight w 1.8 kilonewton downwards forcing on on the lever on the lever and also you you are told that the spring is unstretched when theta angle theta is zero okay so this is angle theta that means if when the lever is just uh, upwards, then the spring is unstretched. So if the angle was like this, then the lever, or let's say if the lever was just vertical, that means the angle would have been zero, and that would have been your initial state where the spring is unstretched. So basically, because of the weight, this thing tries to turn. So the weight here, it's basically pulling the lever downwards, and then that applies a moment that turns the wheel. But then on the other hand, the spring resists against that kind of rotation, so it wants to keep this in balance, and that's essentially the system that we have. And you are asked to calculate the theta For the equilibrium or determine the position of equilibrium the stiffness the constant stiffness of the spring is also given and the dimensions as, as well so we begin by drawing the free body diagram this is the system that we have and this is the free body diagram of that system essentially you have a little circle here on top of the circle you have a force from the spring then you have this lever along the radial direction and 1800 Newton force downwards is also applied on that. If the angle here is theta, then the distance is L sinus theta with L being the distance from O to A and that is given as 200 millimeter. So if you want to know how much moment with respect to to the origin you get from this force it would be just the vertical force downwards times this distance and these are orthogonal to each other okay so that that's essentially how you calculate the moment of the force then at point o you have a hinge support and then you remember if you have a hinge you essentially get two reactions, so you have reactions in the horizontal direction, F1, and then in the vertical direction, F2. The spring force, Fs, is just K times S. K is the spring stiffness, and S is the stretch of the spring. 
So you usually know that spring equation is f equals kx or something like that. It's exactly the same thing. Now x, that, that the stretch of the spring is just s, how much it moves. Now, if theta is small, you can imagine that the, the amount of stretch that you get along the spring is k r theta. If, if theta is not small, you may get the same thing, but then the question would be how the spring is attached to the circle. But then if, if you think that the, the wheel was vertical at the beginning and then it turned, then you can see that this amount, so if, if you think then this is your spring, this amount is r theta, okay? So r theta is basically telling you this. Now, if, if you assume that your spring was attached to the end of it, that also means that's exactly the stretch that you get at your spring. So having that, you can write the balance equations. So the balance equations or equilibrium equations are again the three equations. We, we use the safe option, so we write the balance of forces in the x direction, in the y direction, and balance of moments. And then again, be careful about the directions. In the x direction, we assume usually that pointing towards right is plus, in the y direction, pointing upwards is plus, and then for m, usually counterclockwise is plus. You can do a different convention if you want. It should always give you the same answer eventually. So in the x direction, you have fs and you have f1. So the sum of forces in x direction is zero. That means f1 plus fs is zero. And then pay attention that they point in the same direction. So they, they both appear with a plus sum. In the y direction, f2 is pointing upwards. 1800 Newton is pointing downwards. So you get F2 minus 1800. So this one with the minus, this one with the plus is zero. Now in the rotation equations or in the balance of moment components, this is point O. This point is trying to turn the system in a counterclockwise direction. So you get this L sinus theta, the distance times weight with a plus, and the force F of the Fs of the spring, it tries to turn this in the clockwise direction. So it appears with a minus, and then the distance of the force S from force Fs from the point O is the radius, and you know that that is always the angle is 90 degrees. So it's R Fs with a minus sign. So these are the three balance equations you have essentially three equations, three unknowns. The unknowns are F1, F2, and theta itself. And for theta, you can then end up with this equation that sinus of theta would end up being 0.703 theta. If you solve the system, you get two, two answers. One is theta equals zero, and then again, the other one is theta equals 80.3. So the first thing you should remember that is if theta is zero, we are talking about this situation. And you can imagine that if the, if the lever was exactly upwards, then your spring would be unstretched. So you don't get any force from the spring. And then the vertical, the downward force of the lever would be canceled with the upward force of the reaction or the support reaction and that is your let's say the trivial equilibrium equation that's that's your theta equals zero but more interestingly is when you when you let the lever to just drop and then the question is where it's going to hold its equilibrium and as i mentioned previously you should you should imagine that this spring is basically here and then the stretch of the spring, it follows 
the arc length of the circle. So in that case, you get this r theta as the stretch of the spring. So you don't have to assume theta is small if, if you assume it is connected to the, let's say, to the outer wall of the, of the circle, and then it also stretches with that. Okay, so that is your second answer. Now, it doesn't matter really how you solve this equation. Maybe you, you need to solve it using calculators or using Taylor expansion or something else. It doesn't matter how you solve it. The, the important thing is that you get three equations, three unknowns, and the, the physics of the problem is important for you. The third and the last exercise today is similar to the problem 4.114 from the Beer Johnson book on page 203. You are given a bent rod ABEF supported by two bearings at C and D and a cable AH. On the rod, there is a force 400 Newton applied downwards at point F, and the dimensions are also given in the picture. The portion AB is given to be 250 millimeter. So we know this is 250 millimeter. And you are told that you can assume that bearing D does not exert any axial thrust. That means from the bearing D, you do not get any force in the X direction. You are asked to calculate the tension in wire AH and reactions at C and D. Before we do that, I just mentioned a geometrical feature of this figure. So we, we know this is 250, this is, this is given in the problem. That means the vertical distance here is 250 times sinus of 30, and sinus of 30 is 1 over 2, that means we know that this is 125, okay? So essentially what it means is that if you think about this portion, this is 125 and that's 125. So it's split half and half and basically that tells you this angle is equal to this angle. And you know that this angle is 60 degrees, so basically that means that also this angle is 60 degrees. Okay, so we are dealing with a very particular triangle here with all the angles 60 degrees. So we begin the problem looking into the free body diagram, and then again, because of what I just said, we know this angle is 60 degrees. We draw the free body diagram. This is the bent rod here, and we draw all the external loadings on the free body diagram. Now, external loadings usually mean external forces and moments. But in this case, we do not have any moments, only for this specific problem, because we are dealing with bearings, and bearings at C and D, we learn they do not apply moments at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned that. So we have only forces ap applied from C and D, and then we have only a tension from the cable. So we are dealing with forces only. That's one thing. The other thing is that if you just look at the unknowns, you get C, X, C, Y, C, Z. So three unknowns from bearing at C, D, Y, D, Z, two unknowns from bearing at D because we know that we have assumed D, X is zero. And then T, the tension in the cable is unknown. So you're talking about six unknowns. So we have six unknowns, but we have a three dimensional problem. So usually we should have also six equations and we should be able to solve this. To, to deal with the tension in the cable, we, we write the tension vector as its magnitude 
uh, as its magnitude times its direction. Now the direction is a unit vector along the cable. So it has the length one and we can usually calculate it from the geometry of the problem. So it's a geometrical property and we can say lambda h is a h divided by the norm of a h. If you want to do that, it's fairly simple. You just construct the vector a h by subtracting the coordinates of a from coordinates of h. So you can do that. Then you calculate a h. You calculate the norm of a h, and then this would be your director. This is lambda a h. But also because we know we have this triangle with 60 degree angle here, you can just use that property because this is point H, so you are talking about A H, and then you know here we have a triangle with 60 degree angle. So basically it means that in the K direction or in the opposite K direction, you are dealing with the length of A H times sinus of 60 degree and then in the vertical direction in the y direction you are talking about a h and cosinus of 60 degree so you have exactly these two and then if you if you think about that all, that means alternatively you could have just written this lambda a h using cosine and sine of the 60 degree and cosine of 60 is just one and one half in the j direction in the plus direction upward and then again sine of 60 it points towards the negative direction of z direction that's that's why it comes with a minus and then again remember we are talking about a h like this so a h is pointing towards the negative direction of the k okay so having that this is the tension or what we want to do next is to, is to just write the balance equations. So the governing equations in 3D, there are six equations. You have three balance equations for the forces and three balance equations for the moments. So the balance of forces in the x, y, z directions, we write them first and then we write the balance of moments consequently. For the balance of forces in the x direction, you can only have one force in the x direction, that is Cx, so Cx is zero. Balance of forces in the y direction, you have the vertical component of T upwards, so that is essentially one half of T. Cy and dy are also upwards, so plus Cy plus dy. 400 newton downwards so minus 400 that's that in the z direction you have cz and vz both pointing in the opposite direction of z and then you have the z component of the tension so that's that cz dz so that's balance in the z direction so you get three balance equations for the forces for the balance of forces we could just use this for the balance of moments now we want to go to the next slide for the balance of moments we don't have to write them individually we can just use them in this vectorial manner and we write the balance of moments with respect to point c again remember you could write it with respect to any point you could just say it's with respect to point b zero or with respect to point d zero it would be the same thing the reason we use point C is it's kind of clever because at point C you have the maximum number of unknowns. So you have three unknowns and if you write the balance of moment with respect to C that means none of them would appear in your balance equation. So for that matter we, we use the balance with respect to C and then you get essentially three forces. You get force at A, force at, force at, forces at D and then force at F. So you get these three parts. The moments of the forces at D would be 
RD, FD, and then again RD in this case, that means the distance between C to D. Okay, because we are writing the balance with respect to C. So that's C to D, and then you can see that the distance between C to D is just 300 millimeter in the X direction, so you get 300 I. And the force at D is just the Y in the Y direction and DZ in the Z direction, so that's that. That's the first term. The second term is RF times FF. So the force at F is just downward 400 Newton, so minus 400 J. The RF is essentially the vector CF. So it's, if you think of these two components, this is what we call RF. We want to know how much that distance would cause moment. And then again, that thing has two components. It has a component in X direction, 350 millimeter. And then it has a component in the J direction, or sorry, in the K direction or in the Z direction, that's 250. All right, so having that, then we have RA times FA. So for, for the force A, again, RA is just CA, the vector CA, and the force at A is nothing but the tension. So FA, FA is just the tension that you have, and then the vector RA, you can calculate it from the, the components again. So again, remember that this 125 is essentially this distance and it was given and the same with the 250 that we had here this 250 was also given in the dimensions of the problems of the problem that we are looking at a anyway it's it's a fairly simple calculations once you have all these equations you just need to do the cross products you set them to zero and then you get your three equations so you get three equations in, the, in x direction, in y direction, in z direction. I'm not going to write them here, but important thing is that once you write those equations, you get six equations and you have exactly six unknowns shown in the picture here, and then you can solve this system. And if you solve that, you get the answers for the unknowns here. Obviously, this type of example is relatively calculation heavy so this is not something that i would ask you to to do just for the calculations but it's very important that you can follow what's going on and how to handle problems similar to this also in 3d okay so you shouldn't be carried away but by the just calculation parts that is heavy and so on you should first Try to write the equations properly, and once you have the six equations properly, then of course that should be enough to get the correct solutions. So writing six equations properly, that's the challenge here. Okay, so this was our third lecture on introduction to statics and we talked about equilibrium of rigid bodies and we solved three examples together three exercises together and we basically covered the fourth chapter of the Weir Johnson book again we have six lectures on introduction to statics this was the third one on the series of six lectures and we will have three to come yet I will see you in the next lecture